Thanks for joining us on this special episode of Speaking of Nebraska. I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Tonight we are joined by Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts, also Chief Medical Officer Dr. Gary Antone, and our Commissioner of Education Matt Bloomstead. We're going to be talking about the spread of COVID-19 in Nebraska. You can join the conversation as well tonight by calling us at 800-675-5447, excuse me, 676-5446, or 402-472-1212. Again, we want to welcome everybody to uh, Speaking of Nebraska. And as you can tell, we are also doing our own version of social distancing tonight, keeping the proper six-foot span. We appreciate that, Dennis. Yes, yes. We want to start off with just maybe an overview on a couple of different topics before we get into specific questions. And, Governor, I'll, I'll start with you. We've been into this crisis situation for a couple of weeks now. I want to get your opinion on how you think we're handling it both so far, and I also want your uh, input on what, are we, what can we expect in the next couple of weeks? Where are we going? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, I would say that we are ahead of other states like New York that probably had the virus in their communities much earlier than we've had it here in Nebraska. And what that's allowed us to do is to be able to take some of those restrictive steps to be able to really limit public gatherings. And that's really what this is all about, is limit, limiting those large public gatherings, whether they're kids in schools where you're really concentrated. Uh, I'm sure everybody in Nebraska now is familiar with the 10-person rule the president announced last week. Um, and again, this is really all around trying to limit the spread of the virus so that it doesn't impact the people who are going to be the most vulnerable to this. Older Nebraskans, people with those underlying health conditions like diabetes, or respiratory illnesses or pulmonary illnesses, things like that, because the mortality rates can be very, very high for folks in those categories. So the whole idea is to spread the, the virus out slowly, let it spread slowly throughout our state so that it doesn't peak and overwhelm our health care system. And so far, again, we've by implementing these measures, we have seen that we haven't seen the impacts in some other states like New York. Now, we still have a ways to go to your question about how long will we be this, and it's really too early at this point to tell. When you start putting things in place like we did last week, and actually we actually started limiting public gatherings even the week before that, but it takes a month, six weeks, eight weeks to really know how this is impacting the spread of the virus. I mean, we do see that we're having more cases, but as we ramp up testing, we should see more cases. You know, we should expect to see more cases of people test positively. That's nothing to be alarmed about. But as we get more of that data around who's testing positive, we'll have a better idea of how this is progressing in our state and what uh, kind of steps we need to take and how long it's going to last. Nebraska Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Gary Antone, welcome. And I want to ask you a little bit about uh, something that's the topic of conversation nationally, and that's the peak. So are, will Nebraska's peak be similar to the national peak? And when we do hit that peak, whenever that is, are our hospitals going to be able to handle it? Sure. Um, well, we definitely haven't hit our peak yet. As a matter of fact, we've been only on linear growth right now as far as how our testing is going, which is great because up to this current time, we're just testing the patients we know will probably have a high incidence of testing positive. And knowing that we're testing the highest risk people and not seeing that exponential growth is very, very comforting to me to know that. So when we're going to hit our peak, I'm not quite certain. If I was to venture uh, an estimate, I might say a week or two. So it's given us time to prepare. And we've been preparing for this for over two months now. When this first started back in mid-January, our team in the Division of Public Health have been meeting daily, seven days a week. So we have a great infectious disease team, epidemiology team, hospital preparedness team. I don't think we can be any better prepared than what we are right now. Also joining us is Commissioner of Education, uh, Dr. Matt Bloomstead. Thank you very much. Whole new world for students, for parents, and for teachers as we begin to learn at home. Are we getting up to speed quick enough to still have substantive learning for the rest of this school year. Yeah, it's actually been remarkable, uh -huh. the efforts I think across the state, and I appreciate the governor, actually Dr. Antone as well, for uh, really working with me and thinking about strategies that may work across the state. 
but we asked, began to ask our schools to think about how they might provide kind of remote learning opportunities for their students several weeks ago and said, be prepared for this, be thinking about how you can do that. Um, I think it's been remarkable what we've seen because schools are actually doing f food programs as well, feeding their students, uh, working on that. I've seen great examples of learning uh, on a lot of different fronts from elementary all the way through high school, uh, really thoughtful teachers and educators across the state. And they work together very well and continue to do that. And I, 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 again, I just think it's a remarkable Herculean effort that, that schools are undertaking right now. Well, we've been taking questions from you, the viewers, for the past couple of days over social media, over email. We're also, of course, taking your questions right now if you want to call in. But we have two questions from viewers in western Nebraska about testing for COVID-19 in the state. This is Kim Henson from Harrisburg, Nebraska. My question is, why are we not testing more so that we have a better data representation of who is infected and who is not? My name is Jessica and I live in Scotts Bluff. Do you believe we are at a grave disadvantage going into the next 10 to 14 days because we did not have adequate testing to test all of those with symptoms in the state of Nebraska? So I guess, Governor, we'll start with you and Dr. Right. Antone can certainly weigh in on it as well, but we got a lot of questions about testing and should yeah. we be doing more? So first of all, there's no governor in the country that feels like they've got enough testing. Okay, so nobody feels like they're doing enough testing. We want to expand our testing as well. Uh, we start off with being able to do about 100 tests a day in the public health lab and about 100 tests a day, uh, tests a day in at UNMC's lab. Our lab is now probably up over 400 tests a day because some of the changes in the protocols we've made to be able to do that. We see now that Brian and CHI are coming along line with their testing capabilities. The public labs are coming up, or private labs are coming out with their testing capabilities. So the testing is ramping up. The good news is the models we put together about how we're gonna respond to this all assumed limited testing. So we put together our plan weeks ago with the experts at UNMC. I wanna actually especially credit Dr. James Lawler and Dr. Chris Cradiville for helping us really think through this plan for how we would implement the kind of restrictions we put in place and thinking about it regionally, right? So we've got more restrictions on the eastern end of the state than we do in the rest of the state. And that's because we see more of those cases. Uh, we're being very conservative with regard to this model as well. So for example, the model we put together originally said if somebody presents themselves to the hospital with these kind of symptoms, we can't figure out how they got it, you know, that, that community spread. Well, but we're actually not waiting for them to be that sick. The, we're testing people and finding them that maybe aren't sick enough to go to the hospital, but we still can't figure out how to do it. We're still counting that as community spread. So there's a lot of fudge factors built into this that make it more conservative. And that's how we've implemented some of these restrictions to really slow down the spread of the virus. So we do want to make sure that we expand that testing. And as we do, we're gonna start testing more people in the healthcare, our first responders, you know, our firefighters, EMTs, uh, corrections officers, police, and then also uh, those of us, uh, you know, that are in nursing homes. You know, we need to, that's a very vulnerable population. We would do more testing around there. So we're working to be able to expand that through our labs. We're looking to work with the federal government. We're looking to buy them out in the open market to be able to expand it. And I think what you're going to see, in fact, I was just talking to Tom Poland, who's the, who's the uh, CEO of BD, Beckton Dickinson, and they've got several facilities here in our state. They're working on a, a new testing platform, they think. It's, you know, it's going to be several weeks out before they are ready to release it. But again, that'll be another opportunity. So you see American industry really looking to ramp up to be able to do that testing. It's going to take you know, several weeks, a month, six weeks, something like that, for us to see that benefit. But as we start getting more of that testing, then we'll be able to make better predictions on how it's spreading across the state. And as opposed to using some of the rule of thumb things we're using right now, like is there somebody who we can't figure out how they got the virus and so that's a community case for that community and we need to put the more restrictions there. We'll be able to get better data to make more precise determinations about what kind of restrictions we need to put in place and how long they need to last. Dr. Antone, do you want to weigh in as well? Sure. The um, fascinating thing for me to see is how public health works and how it worked in this, in this case. And of course, at first we had limited testing just because of the availability of the test kits. Everybody talks about the test kits. And what I saw is that when we had our first case, I saw how the local public health departments were right on top of making sure they contacted every close contact with that case. And then as we got another case, the same thing. 
and how well the public health departments, there's 19 in the state of Nebraska, work together as a team to do this. It was an amazing thing for me to see. And I think that's one of the reasons why we haven't seen that exponential growth because of all their work of contacting the high risk individuals and keeping them isolated, quarantined, or at least at home. So we didn't see that great exponential growth that you've seen in some other states. So it's been a totally impressive thing for me to see how our public health department works together as a team. To keep that curve flat, so to speak, I've been told not to say keep Nebraska flat because we're not <laughs> flat, but yeah, right. uh, we are keeping Nebraska flat at the current yeah. time. One of the questions that was sent in to us comes from Irene from Dunbar, and she talks about, in particular, rural testing in rural areas. She says, why are we practically ignoring small town rural area hospitals in terms of COVID-19 tests? Do citizens from rural areas need to drive two plus hours or more just to be able to test? How would you answer that? Well, we're definitely working on that. You know, we're working on expanding testing to the rural areas. Obviously, we concentrate on the high risk areas where travelers were mostly going to and the highest risk patients, the ones that had probably traveled internationally. And now we're working on more domestic travelers, too. And we will be developing testing out in rural Nebraska. We have well, in uh, place, uh, and plans say, in place to do that. Well, I would say we actually, so again, we've got a criteria for how we're testing people, right? And so it's, if you've got the symptoms, you know, that the, the high fever, the cough, the shortness of breath, and you've been to those high risk areas like Europe or Asia that Dr. Anton's referring to, or you've been in contact with somebody, or you've been someplace like New York or Northern California or Seattle, and so we, we do test those folks. And I would say that if you look at when we get a profile of somebody like that in a rural area, they do get tested. So for example, we know we've got a case from Knox County. We've got a case from Nemaha County. Um, you know, we are looking for those cases in the rural counties. They just haven't come up as much because I think to Dr. Anton's point, we are, you know, probably more prevalence of high risk people are in the more urban areas, but we are finding them in our rural counties too. Now, primarily these have all been travel related, so they haven't caused us to, to do the type of restrictions in those counties that we've done, say, in the counties on the eastern part of the state. But rural counties are receiving that uh, priority if those folks meet all those criteria and have the same kind of high risk profile of the other people we've been testing. So another question on testing comes from Corey in Lincoln. And he says, since the testing is so sparse, has the state considered reporting the presumptive positive cases so the public has a better idea of possible spread? So I'll take that one first. Okay. And uh, the term presumptive positive first started because all testing that was done in the state of Nebraska had to be verified by the Center of Disease Control in Atlanta. And so the test was considered a presumptive positive until it was confirmed in Atlanta by the CDC. Now the definition of the term presumptive positive means somebody that we think has the clinical diagnosis of COVID symptoms, but hasn't been tested. And we are, again, developing a plan on how we can track that. It's a little bit more difficult than, than you know, tracking the positive tests, but we will develop a plan to start test or keeping track of those presumptive positive clinical diagnosis cases. Dr. Boomstead, I want to turn to you a little bit. Uh, earlier this week, you talked about a recommendation that uh, schools not return to school this school year. Uh, what led you to that decision? Yeah, first of all, a lot of the, when you look around the nation, I think one of the concerns for us is I'm really said to to schools across the state that they're part of the solution right now. That returning too soon could cause uh, problems for the additional spread. And also schools were asking, how do we plan for a year where we're interrupting it for a period of time? So I think it's easier for us to think about um, completing the year in the kind of uh, remote learning and uh, environment that we're in. Schools needed that type of guidance, I believe, for me, but also I think as we look at how testing might expand around the state, I think it's, it's better for schools to be able to plan what, a little, with a little more certainty instead of kind of waiting for that other shoe to drop in so many cases. Also, because of how COVID-19 is, is spread, you don't always know. And so students might not have the same symptoms as, as uh, adults might have. And so it can spread quickly through a community, I think, with, with the mass gatherings of, of students. And so we really looked at it and had great conversations and have talked uh, all over the state. Our ESUs have worked with our school districts to really 
take those recommendations, look at it, work with public health. And I think that's been a good strategy for the state. Uh, you know, I certainly have had a few folks go, well, Commissioner, you're, you're ruining my graduation opportunity. And obviously, I mean, I have a high school senior myself, right? I mean, it's a tough, a tough thing to recommend, but I think it's better. We're all part of the public health uh, mission right now that we're trying to make sure that Nebraska is doing best around the whole country, maybe around the, the whole world on how we handle COVID-19. Governor Rickett, Sally in Bellevue asked the question, uh, do you agree with President Trump that the country will be up and running by Easter? And I know you're in contact with President Trump. You're talking with him on conference calls. And do you agree with, with what has been a very positive approach or a very hopeful approach he's taken that we're going to be back to normal much sooner than a lot of other people are saying? Well, I think the important thing to remember is that the nation and the state are not going to experience this at the same rate. So we can certainly see places like New York, Northern California, Seattle that have been greatly impacted by this. Other places have not been as greatly impacted. And even in here in the state of Nebraska, as we've talked about, right, we've put some of these directive health measures in place that are more restrictive in some of our counties like, you know, Douglas, Sarpy, Dodge, Saunders, Cass, Lancaster, than we have in other parts of the state. So we're really looking at regionalizing how we're responding here in Nebraska. And for example, in some of those counties I just named, you know, this directive health measure is going to go to April 30th or May 7th. So, you know, there may be other places where that is not going to be quite so restrictive, but I think that just like our state, which is being impacted differently at different times, we're going to do what's best for each kind of region of the state based upon our public health districts. And I think the states are going to be the same way. They're going to do what they think is best for their state based upon the conditions they've got on the ground. I want to talk a little bit more about hospitals and how they're preparing. Lori from Sydney asks, is there a plan in place for the transfer of patients from critical access hospitals to a higher level of care once the critical access hospitals' capabilities are exceeded? There's definitely a plan in place, and it, it'll work very similar to how it works now. When there's a critical patient at a, at a critical access hospital that might not have the facilities to take care of a critically ill patient, We'll use that same type of transport mechanism. We have the transport services already prepared for this, and we have the hospitals prepared for this, the accepting hospitals. So we'll definitely make sure that happens. I want to also turn back to Commissioner uh, Bloomstead a little bit, and you were, I want to dig a little bit further on this because Luke of Lincoln, who is a high school senior, uh, wrote in and he said, uh, I'm facing a lot of uncertainty, which is very distressing. Can you share any solid plans currently in place or being worked on to help the seniors in high school in Nebraska? Yeah, so number one, we've had a lot of conversations with schools about how to handle their, their seniors. And at, at a school level, really carrying uh, board members and, and school officials working on those plans with their seniors. I've, I've, asked, I've asked schools across the state to really think about the most structure around their, gradu around their seniors. So graduation is really clear and that their credits are as clear as possible. Um, Honestly, many of the seniors across the, the state have completed three full quarters, right, or three, you know, three-fourths of their year. So it puts us in a good position for, for schools to uh, address those seniors' needs. There's a lot of uncertainty for seniors in the sense that a lot of things they wanted to be able to do. And, and obviously, uh, we'll be working closely with each school on those, those decisions on how they do that. Generally, when I'm getting questions right now from school officials, I say, hey, look, you really know your seniors well. Work with the ones that are going to need a little more help maybe to complete their year, and the others, let them soar like we know they can. Governor Ricketts, we'll go to central Nebraska now, and Dawn in Kearney asks, should more stringent guidelines be enforced in greater Nebraska like what is being done in eastern Nebraska? So what we are doing with regard to our plan is we're really breaking up the state by region. Because when we put these restrictive measures in place, we don't want to go too early because then um, you maybe lose the benefit because people get tired and they start stop paying attention as much when you actually really need them to start paying attention when the virus is spreading. So that's the way we've decided to approach this. And the way we're doing it is we're based, again, on a kind of this rule of thumb about community cases. In Omaha, it was two community cases, which means, again, a case that we can't figure out how the person got it. If we can track that person back and say, oh, yeah, this person traveled to the U.K. and that's how that person got it. That's not a case we're worried about because then, to Dr. Antone's point, we get public health and they can go check with everybody and make sure everybody they were in contact with from the time they got back in this country is quarantined. 
But that community spread case, we don't know how many people they were talking to, and that's what gives us most concern. And that's when we get that, that's when we start putting those restrictions in place. So we had that, for example, in Omaha first, and we got those counties in the Omaha area. We just had one um, in Saunders County, and so we added those restrictions for Saunders and Dodge County and then put Washington, because that Washington had been in with Omaha before. We lumped them in now with the Three Rivers area there. And then Lancaster County just got their first community spread case this week, and so we did it for Lancaster. With regard to Buffalo County, for example, we've had cases test positive, but we, we, we know how they got them, and so we're not as concerned about those. But if we were to get a case of that where we just can't figure out how the person got it, that's when we, in that area around Kearney, would do the same sort of thing we've done in Lincoln, we've done in Omaha, put those more, those more restrictive measures in place. But again, we've got that plan that we put together weeks ago to address this, and we're working that plan. We're going to stick with that plan. And, you know, when we get that case, no matter where it is, you know, regionally in the state, that's when we'll implement those more restrictive procedures. Call that came in uh, during this program, Steve from Lincoln, says with a possible recession looming, would the governor support more infrastructure spending like dams in northeast Nebraska? Well, it, it's certainly clear that we're going to have an economic impact here with regard to the economy and how that's going to play out. We will have a plan to address that. And in fact, the federal government package that the Senate passed yesterday, I think the House is supposed to take it up tomorrow, vote on it, get it to the president's desk. We'll also change those plans. So I would say we will look at all the different kinds of things we think can help support, you know, getting our economy back on track after, you know, what is sure to be, uh, you know, it's really been a hard hit for a lot of people and will sure to be that way as long as we're putting some of these restrictive measures in place. So we'll certainly take a look at those options, but we haven't, you know, we're still we're focusing right now on how do we slow the spread of the virus. We're starting to look at those plans for how do we do the economic recovery, but the priority right now is still slowing the spread of the virus here in the state. And as part of that uh, economic recovery, a staggering unemployment numbers released both in Nebraska, uh, 15, over 15,000 claims. 15,668. Exactly, and nationwide over 3 million. So as you plan for when we're not dealing as much with coronavirus, when we're coming out of this, how do you get people back to work? Well, one of the things I'm encouraging employers right now is to take a look at, can you hold on to these folks? Because, you know, ironically, the thing we were talking about right up until the moment this coronavirus struck was we don't have enough people in Nebraska to take all the jobs we got. So I'd really encourage employers, think about how you hold on to these people because you were all desperate for them before. And I expect the economy is going to bounce back and you're going to need them again. So we have programs, for example, in our Department of Labor our short-time compensation program, for example, that allows businesses to hold on to people part-time, but then they collect unemployment part-time. So that's going to be one of our strategies. And again, we have job coaches in the Department of Labor that when we start seeing these jobs turn around, that we want to get people connected back to those. And then frankly, at the state of Nebraska, we've got positions right now we are hiring. If, you're in, if, you, have an, if you are interested in a career in corrections, come talk to us. We've got jobs available. If you're interested in helping our veterans, our Department of Veterans Affairs have, have jobs open to be able to help work in our veterans' homes. So we've got jobs we're hiring right now. So if people are looking, come, com, come contact to us. And then, again, as we get more geared up, we're going to help those people get back to work through our Department of Labor and the programs there. And right now, again, I'd encourage employers, if you can, try and figure out how you hold on these people, even part-time. Take advantage of some of the programs we have or some of the small business loans that are going to be coming out that will be loan forgiveness if you hold on to your people because I expect that you're going to need those folks as the economy heats back up again. Chief Medical Officer Gary Antone, uh, let's talk ventilators. There's a lot of talk about that nationwide. Are we going to have enough ventilators to handle this in Nebraska? And Tara from Lincoln asked the question, are we going to be sending ventilators out of Nebraska to support other states? Well, to answer that last question first, I've thought about that. I mean, I would love to do that. I would love to get to the point where we will predict that we won't need the number of ventilators that we even have right now. And just to answer the first part of the question, we have about 600 ventilators available right now. Now, the team in the Omaha metropolitan area and the Lincoln-Lancaster area and some other areas the CMOs and the CEOs got together and canceled elective surgeries over a week ago. And that will free up ventilators from the OR, from the surgical centers, to even give us more ventilators than what we have now. I'm hoping that we don't have a, enough sick people that will even need to go on a ventilator, though. And, and the way that things look right now, we're in great shape. But I know we've worked 
on getting hospital censuses down because of canceling of those elective surgeries. And we've even prepared some other hospitals that have had vacant beds to prepare for you know, what might be an influx of patients in, in those hospitals. And if I could piggyback on that for a second as well, one of the things we're doing at the state is we're looking at the modeling of, again, there's a lot we don't know about how the virus is spreading right now. And so we, you know, we need to get more data and better data about how it's progressing. But one of the things we want to look at is, okay, so what is our peak need going to be? Where do we find that? And then how many ventilators will we need to go out and buy in the open market? So we're looking at the state level to buy those and help supply them. But I'd also say we got great companies here that are already being innovative and thinking about that. You know, Dr. Antone mentioned the freeing up of the ventilators by canceling elective surgeries. But we also, like Bryan Healthcare System, they had 34 ventilators they'd used in anesthesiology that some sharp young guy there said, hey, you know, we could, with a very little bit of work, convert these over to be ventilators to be used in an ICU room. And so, you know, that's a great example of how people are thinking creatively about how we can do it. I've been talking to Governor Kim Reynolds in Iowa. She's got people in Iowa and Iowa State that are looking at, can they 3D print the parts for a ventilator? So I talked to our president, Ted Carter, and said, hey, can you reach out and see if there's a way that we can collaborate on this and maybe we can 3D print parts for ventilators and assemble them. And, you know, we're pulling in other private companies to see how we might do it. So there's a lot of people who are really thinking creatively about how do we address the needs for things like ventilators here in our state. Well, tonight's program is available on our website. You can just go to netnebraska.org slash speaking of Nebraska. You can also send us your questions for tonight's live town hall on social media. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at NET News Nebraska. We'll be right back after this short break. The growing season is right around the corner and that means Backyard Farmer is back. Be sure to mark your calendars for the April return of your favorite gardening show, Backyard Farmer. Kim Todd and the panel of experts return to answer your garden questions and make gardening fun again. Don't miss Backyard Farmer coming back in April on NET. Coming Thursday, April 2nd at 7 p.m. Central on NET. I'm Mark Leonard, General Manager for NET. The news about COVID-19 is constantly changing. You can trust our local news team, PBS and NPR to help you sort fact from fiction. We're committed to providing trusted news and important information on television, radio, online, and on our social media channels. You can find our local reporting and facts about COVID-19 at netnebraska.org slash coronavirus. Thank you for watching and supporting this essential service. Welcome back to Speaking of Nebraska. I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. We continue our town hall with Governor Pete Ricketts, also Nebraska Chief Medical Officer Dr. Gary Antone, and Education Commissioner Matt Bloomstead. Uh, what questions do you have about COVID-19 in Nebraska? Give us a call. The numbers are 800-676-5446 or 402-472-1212. You can also send us an email at news at netnebraska.org. Let's start off this segment with a question from one of our viewers. My name is Chad with Lincoln, Nebraska. My question is, what are we doing for the homeless population? What resources do we have? And what plans do we have in place to make sure they are both taken care of and housed during quarantine? Governor Ricketts, we'll start with you. Yeah, absolutely. So this is one of the things that we've been working on. So for example, we're working on setting up quarantine sites or being able to take people who don't have some place to quarantine, like the homeless, and be able to move them into um, some of the people we've been talking to. And we're not quite ready to share that yet because we don't have the contract signed, so I don't want to talk about that yet. But absolutely, we are thinking about what do we do with folks who don't have a place to quarantine? Where can we give them some place to safely stay while they're either developing symptoms or recovering from symptoms or so forth. Uh, also, with the, the federal package that was passed, there'll be changes to the way that we you know, are able to provide uh, services to people who need our help, and so we'll be taking advantage of those. Uh, some of the things we've done, for example, uh, I have loosened up some of the restrictions on the, you know, the SNAP program, the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, the Aid for Dependent Children program, those kinds of uh, programs that we provide some of those services to make it easier for people to access. So. Chad is exactly right. We need to be thinking about how we're going to help take care of that population. 
we got a team in place, and I'd say just stay tuned as we have some announcements, as we get some of these contracts in place and announce some of our plans for what we're, how we're going to help those folks. We'll stay with you, Governor Ricketts, for the next question. It comes from Fran from Cheney. Uh, with the state re will the state release elderly and infirm prisoners to prevent the spread of this disease in prisons? So we already have a compassionate care parole program. We've had that now for a couple of years at the state of Nebraska. So there's a whole channel already for anybody who fits into that category that they can take advantage of. So there's not, nothing special that we're going to do for those folks. There's already a program to do it, and the parole board will take that up as appropriate. You know, people apply, and they kind of work through that process. Let's talk about rural broadband because it affects people accessing health information. Mm -hmm. It affects people working at home and, and learning at home as well. Tom from Fairfield asks, what can be done to make Internet more affordable and accessible in greater Nebraska because we need it since we're having to stay home for work and obtain health information? Yeah, so one of the things that the Public Service Commission has done is work with Internet providers, and I've seen a number of them have started waiving fees and so forth and making sure that you don't get cut off for non-payment and that sort of thing to be able to do it. Uh, rural broadband is obviously a topic we were talking about even before the coronavirus. We had a rural broadband task force that met over the course of last year and made a number of recommendations. We've been talking with a number of providers about how we can expand that broadband and what are some of the creative solutions we might be able to do. So, but you know, when you're talking about short term, I think the thing that's probably gonna be the most impactful is what some of the carriers are doing to say, hey, we're, we're not gonna cut people off, we're, we're gonna waive fees, that sort of thing to make it all more affordable. Commissioner Bloomstead, does it worry you uh, with so many people relying on, on learning at home with the situation with rural broadband? Yeah, we certainly have some areas that would be challenged to be able to have broadband service for, for their students. Um, actually, one of the things we had submitted before was um, broader access to the ed education broadband service. And actually, the governor's office of C CIO, the uh, chief information officer, NET, and the Department of Education submitted plans to, to try to expand that. I think that becomes part of our long-term strategy. In our short term, there is some push to actually put hot spots in the, in the hands of students that don't otherwise have them um, to be able to use those services in, in our short term. E-rate, so the, the federal funding that allows schools to provide uh, internet access in, in their schools, they're talking about how that can be actually expanded for some of those hot spots and, and other fronts. So I am concerned because we know we have areas that are struggling that way, but we also have schools working with their families to understand what their situation is and giving them uh, resources that are appropriate for what technology they have at home. And, and Commissioner, one of the things you might want to talk about is also how you've got that broadband access to all the schools and how that works and how people can take advantage of that in a wireless way. Yeah, in fact, I've, I've seen some of our, uh, our schools actually kind of try to broadcast further their, their broadband services. It's happened for a long time, so evening where, where students are able to maybe get it within the community a little bit if they're close enough to the school. Um, we've actually seen in the past where students might actually drive up to use uh, internet on a Occasion, they might be able to download something by being close to the school and then be able to take that home. So there's some strategies, I think, that are developing and that they can use, but it's been critical. I mean, our broadband access within schools is very, very strong. It's, it's really that home-based part of it that, that we continue to look at on how to expand that. And, and schools right now look for innovations just like they are in the healthcare arena. As part of that, too, uh, our providers really want to provide telehealth services to their patients. And that would be critical for that. And uh, we're working with the Nebraska Medical Association on, on lining all that up now with our providers and our carriers. Has what's happened now pushed that effort forward? Is it accelerated it? No doubt it has. I think it's going to change the way that a lot of medicine is practiced in the future as far as clinical practice, seeing patients in the clinic and things of that nature. Has Dr. Bloomstead and I have talked. I think this is going to change a lot of things mm -hmm. on the way we practice medicine and maybe even higher education. Doctor, uh, or not doctor, but Governor Rick. Don't promote me. <laughs> I'm having promoted you. <laughs> Interesting question from Mark on Facebook. He says, Governor Ricketts, have there been any recommendations from the UNMC team that you have decided not to adhere to? And, and I just want to say that we've gotten a lot of questions about who has your ear when it comes to medical advice? Yeah, so again, what we did is, and this was weeks ago when this all first started bubbling up, we sat down with the experts and they actually started off by making a presentation. It was Dr. James Lawler, uh, Dr. Chris Cradiville, and of course Dr. Jeff Gold, who's the Chancellor at UNMC, was also heavily involved with this. Sat down and kind of gave us an overview of what this looked like. 
we sat down with them and kind of walked through what a plan would look like to be able to, again, limit, the whole key is about limiting those large public groups. And this was based a lot of what Dr. Lawler learned when he looked at the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic and some of the assumptions and some of the things he saw then and what he was seeing from China and that sort of thing. And so it was really a, a very collaborative process when we came up with what we're doing. And when we look at, when we, you know, once you get into it, you start fine tuning some of the details. And then what we'll do is we'll contact Dr. Lawler, and actually I'm, I'm probably talking to somebody at UNMC just about every day um, about something, some question or whatever. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Like when we were talking about the daycare, you know, the child care providers, the, last week the president had the 10 person rule. And so we we're talking about, okay, now how do we balance the need of limiting large crowds to 10 people, but yet we still have to have child care providers? And so we looked at what Governor Hogan did in Maryland, because again, he kind of had to deal with this a little bit sooner than we did. We looked at what he did, and he said, like, of all the things that he wanted to, like, limit, he, he realized daycare was going to be a huge thing that he had to maintain. And so we said, well, what about if we kept 10 kids per classroom? You know, stable population, can't mix them at recess, can't mix them for cafeteria and eating, things like that. But if we did that, could we have 10 kids per classroom? And then we took that to Dr. Lawler and asked him that question to get his advice. And again, how, does, how will that impact? And he's like, yep, I see why you're doing that. I think the cost-benefit trade-off there is worth it. You should, you should make that guidance be 10 kids per classroom. So it's really been a collaborative process like that as we've had to kind of fine tune the details from the plan that we established several weeks ago. But at every step along the way, we really seek to get that input from you know, the experts, whether it's Dr. Lawler or the folks we have in our own epidemiology department, the public health officials across the state. We try to make that a very collaborative process. If I could just add on to that sure. too. Again, I got to see firsthand how things worked down at the University of Nebraska Medical Center when, when the repatriates came yeah. back from China. It was an amazing thing to see. And why did they come back to Omaha? Because Omaha is like the leading area for emergency preparedness, for, for epidemics like this. And to have their expertise and to see how everything was handled down there is uh, it's just it's very, very good for Nebraska to have their expertise down there. So Governor, you talked about daycares and let's talk a little bit about that because we now, we're now in a situation where there can be some temporary daycares that open with nonprofits and churches and schools, but that isn't sitting well with three daycare providers in Lincoln. Brooke and Kirsten and Jesse write, what is the purpose of allowing for temporary child care providers to quickly operate in schools, hospitals, and churches? Centers in the Lincoln area, and we presume other areas of the state as well, are barely operating and have many openings for children, often sending staff home early and short of hours. Having more places open for child care will only hurt those of us trying to maintain our business. Well, I think what we're, again, these temporary places are just that, they're temporary. And... What we're trying to do is create more capacity because we know that there were daycare centers who had, say, 500 kids but couldn't keep 500 kids anymore. They could only keep 100. So that was 400 kids, maybe as many families, who then had to find other alternatives for their child care. So what we're trying to do is address that kind of concern. Uh, I'm kind of surprised to hear we've got some capacity in some of those daycares because we, again, and of course the more restrictions in Lincoln just kicked in yesterday, I think it was. So that may be a temporary thing that they've got capacity because as we see kind of the same restrictions in Lincoln go in that we've had in Omaha and other places like that, they may find that there's going to be more parents who are looking for that. So, but generally what we've heard is that we got parents who cannot find a place to put their kids. And these are also parents who are our first responders, you know, our firefighters, our police, our EMTs, our corrections officers, they're our healthcare workers. If those folks can't go to work because they can't find childcare, then we're going to be risking the public safety. And that's what this is about, is really trying to make sure that those high priority people have a place to take their kids so they can go to work and keep us safe. And will those temporary daycares still have to meet the same kind of strict guidelines that the normal daycares have to meet? So some of the guidelines, absolutely. So for example, the requirement to do the background check and do the criminal background check and all that sort of thing, yes, absolutely. But they are again, what we've done is trying to make this a temporary program that would be set up in churches and so forth, so it's not meant to be permanent. So it will be something that is, when the emergency ends, then those things, those daycares will go away. Uh, Commissioner Bloomstead, uh, we had a number of questions on this topic as well. I'm going to pick one from Casey. Um, and Casey says, some school districts are requiring certain staff to report to school buildings as normal, even if in-person <clears throat> classes are canceled. 
How long does it take for the district to no longer be in charge and have the governor or the Department of Education step in? The longer we continue to report as normal, the more we put ourselves and our families at risk. Yeah, one of, one of the things we're really encouraging with school districts is that they provide flexibility with their staff. But in many cases, what they're trying to do is actually spread their staff out so that their staff aren't, aren't experiencing, you know, too close of quarters. Schools are big buildings without students in them in particular, right? There's, there's, there's room to spread out. And so I think um, one of our concerns always is, is, hey, look, do individual teachers or employees of the district have something that they're more concerned about? And some of them may need daycare and child care. And I appreciate the governor. I think I don't remember what day it was, but I appreciate the governor. You know, this, the teachers bring their, their children to work. Um, probably is not a great ideal situation right now, but I would love to see some flexibility by schools with those, those teachers that might have kids of their own to give them a little more flexibility in, in what their schedules are. In some school districts, we're seeing uh, reporting in different ways and working from home. So it's a mix of things right now, and, uh, and it's complex because it depends on the district's technology and the teacher's access to technology and how they're, how they're needing that. So. And Governor, and is there if, a point where well, you would step in? Well, I, I want to just make a, a point about this is that, again, the, the coronavirus is a virus, and it's a respiratory disease that if you're, with, if you're outside of six feet from somebody, again, this is why we're six feet away today, right? If I cough, generally, I'm not going to give you the virus if you're six feet away. So if you're in a work environment where you can keep those distances and do all the other things we've talked about, you know, stop shaking hands, do the elbow bump or wave, we really insist that, you know, look, if you have a fever, a uh, cough, you need to stay home. And especially in those areas where we've got those Director of Health Measures like Omaha and Lincoln, everybody in your household needs to stay home too. So until you know you get a chance to talk to your doctor, maybe you find out it's flu, and then you stay home until you're over the flu, and then you go back to work. But you know, there's the flu is still more way prevalent in our state than coronavirus, and you're not going to get coronavirus just by walking past somebody. Okay, so the risk of getting it, as long as you're keeping those social distances, is very very low, and we don't want people not to go to work. Uh, you know, we want people to go to work if they're feeling comfortable to do so. So as long as you're taking those good practices, you really, your risk of getting it is going to be very, very low. You're going to, get to wash your hands often for 20 seconds at a time. Don't touch your face. You know, all those sort of things will help prevent the spread of the virus. But even if you're, again, the whole goal around what we're doing as far as protective measures like closing down schools is about preventing those large groups of people from gathering. Schools are one of the most concentrated places where we have people, right? We have, you know, maybe anywhere from 15 to 30 kids in a classroom. But if you take those kids out of the classroom and you only have one teacher there, well, that's actually probably more room than most office people have, right? So you're at very low risk in a situation like that. And even if you have to be closer than some six feet uh, to do your job or whatever your business is, again, if you're taking those you know, good common sense hygiene things, your risk of getting a virus is very low, no different than if you were you know, gonna pass the flu to somebody. Again, it's about practicing that good hygiene and making sure that you're you know, thinking consciously ab about all those good things we've talked about with uh, physical distancing that will help make sure that we really reduce the spread of virus, and that's really what this is all about. These, so. these precautions that the governor are talking about, I can't uh, think we can't get away without saying this. They're called non-pharmaceutical interventions, NPI for short. Oh, well, the doctor had to say that, I had right? had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's not as good as a vaccine, but it's, it is good. I mean, it, it will decrease probably the number of people that will become infected, number one. And it will flatten that or spread out that curve of the virus that people will get. Yeah, and if I could just, because this is, again, one of the things that uh, the UNMC folks really wanted to emphasize. Each measure by itself is not sufficient, okay? So if you're just doing, say, I'm six feet away, or you're just not touching your face, or you're just coughing to your elbow or shaking hand, each of those things, or if we're just limiting public gatherings to 10 people, individually by themselves, they're not enough. But as you layer them one on top of the other, you can kind of get a Swiss cheese effect. You know, one slice of Swiss cheese, Swiss cheese has a lot of holes in it, but if you start layering layer on layer on layer of Swiss cheese, eventually you get so there's very little, you know, hole, there's very little space left in that block of cheese. That's what this whole strategy is about, is layering those, all those different steps we're taking to be able to create something that really slows the spread of the virus. So the schools is one, one really important part of this, but it's just one part of it. We've got to make sure that you know, people are, you know, this is something everyone, every Nebraska can be a part of, that we're all doing our part to be part of that layer of protection because it needs all those layers to be effective. 
got a number of questions about shelter in place. We've heard that in, in other situations in California and in New York. You've said that you don't want to go there, at least not now. So what are those benchmarks you're looking at that would maybe prompt you to say, yeah, it's time for us to shelter in place? Well, again, this gets back to the plan we prepared weeks ago with UNMC. It never called for that because it doesn't really, I mean, look, I'm not on the ground in New York. And New York is very different from Nebraska, right? New York probably had virus spreading around the community in mid-January, if not before, because of their connections to China. You know, these direct flights, right, to Beijing and things like that. I mean, China probably had this virus in November. They only acknowledged it December 31st. So there were probably lots of people who came to New York from China, spread the virus around, and so they're in a very different situation than we are. But here in Nebraska, we don't have that type of connection. And so the plan we put together was really based upon the needs we have in Nebraska. Not any of those discussions did anybody say we had to do one of those shelter in place or lockdowns? It's really about large groups of people. It's about making sure large groups of people uh, don't get together. And that's why, you know, we say we don't have to do that because, you know, we've limited that in places like restaurants and bars. We've limited it to 10 people and other businesses. That's going to be sufficient to be able to slow the spread of the virus. And by itself, it's not enough. You know, we have to do those other things I talked about. But we don't need to do that because it really doesn't get you very much. I mean, there's a cost-benefit trade-off there. It just doesn't get you that much because it's really about limiting those large public gatherings. And we're already doing that. We don't need to shut down all those other businesses where you have very little large public gathering. What we need is to make sure we're really focusing on those businesses that have larger public gatherings, that we keep them to 10 people or less, and especially in those confined areas. Let's talk about bars and restaurants, and Lauren Hastings wants to talk about that. She says, why haven't you taken steps to slow or prevent transmission by asking or mandating that bars and restaurants go to delivery only? And I'm especially concerned about young adults who may still be visiting bars and restaurants, and they don't see the risk there. So, again, this gets back to the plan we put together, you know, weeks ago with our experts at UNMC, where we're going to take those more restrictive measures as we see that community sp spread. In Hastings so far, for example, we haven't seen it. And so if we implement those measures too early, people, first of all, they're not necessary. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't get you anything. And also then people are going to get tired. And then they maybe start breaking those bands just when you need them to stick home, you know, just when you need them to not go to those public gatherings. And then what happens is since you, you put them in too, uh, in too early and people start ignoring them when you actually need them to, you get the spread of the virus taken off. So what we're trying to do is really time this, again, by region of the state to when it's going to be important. So, for example, if we get one of those cases where we can't figure out how the person got the coronavirus in Hastings, that's when we'll implement the same sort of measures that we have in Omaha and Lincoln now in that Hastings area. So we will do that if we see the triggers that we got. And again, as we get better testing, we'll be able to be more precise than just that rule of thumb of one community spread case, that case we don't know where it came from. We'll get, to, we'll get better at that and be able to have more precise numbers. But right now, we're using that rule of thumb. And, and again, the model we put in place assumed we would have limited testing. And this is part of what we worked on with Dr. Lawler and the, the, the folks at UNMC, is we assumed at these early stages we'd have limited testing. And that's how we developed this kind of rule of thumb. Dr. Antone, we have a Lincoln resident in an assisted living facility asking how people in her situation can both self-isolate and also receive care. Why can't everyone be tested, including the caregivers? What about caregivers testing? So it's definitely a concern of ours, our assisted living facilities, skilled nursing facilities, long-term care facilities. And we are limiting visitors to those facilities to only really end of life type situations. So that was the first step we took. And then, of course, we want to get the health care workers, if they show any symptoms, they're the first ones to get tested. And as far as living in isolation, most, most of them have their own rooms, so they are basically in self-isolation. And we've limited the communal gatherings, like dining facilities and other activities, so that they don't gather anymore. Governor Claudia from Scotts Bluff asks, why are driver's license offices still open? Stop this while our area is still free of the virus. What about state offices? So again, we're not trying to shut businesses down, right? We're trying to limit large public gatherings. And we still want to be able to provide services to the people in Nebraska. So we've worked with our Department of Motor Vehicles to be able to, again, limit the size of crowds, people coming in, space them out, right? I mean, if you go to, for example, Costco here in Lincoln, They've got tape on the ground, six feet apart, so if you're in the checkout line, you're not getting too close to uh, your next customer. They're wiping down the conveyor belt that takes the groceries to the checkout stand um, you know, between every customer. 
Well, we're doing the same types of things in the DMV to try and space people out. And we're also taking other steps as well. So, for example, if uh, you meet certain conditions for your driver's license, like say you're 65 or older, we're actually just automatically extending those. So anybody 65 or older doesn't actually have to come in to get their driver's license renewed uh, you know, for the foreseeable future because we're just going to extend them. So I've already issued an executive order on that to be able to make it easier for that. And we're looking at other steps like that so that we can really limit the number of people who actually do need to go on. We got a way you can, just about everybody else can go online and renew. So we tell people, look, don't come in, go online, renew that way. That's a way you don't even have to go to the office. So, but there are some people who will still want to come to the office or need to come to the office, and we got to continue to provide those services. And so we're, again, we're being thoughtful about how we do it and how we limit the number of people there. But again, it's not about shutting things down, folks. It's about limiting the size of crowds, especially in confined areas, to like that 10 people or less. So there have been some more restrictive uh, uh, things implemented on hair salons and barbers in Douglas County, but not and recommendations made for the rest of the state. But Joan asked the question, what is the directive for massage and tattoo businesses? They can't follow the six-foot rule. So again, what we're saying from the state is, just because you do your job and you have to be closer than somebody's six foot, that's okay. Now, having said that, local public health departments, like they did in Douglas County, have the op option of being more restrictive than what the state is doing. And we allow that to allow those local public health departments to, be, to t really tailor their plans to their communities. We're trying not to be a one-size-fit-all type government. We want to try and be as flexible as we can to be able to limit the spread of the virus and uh, do that in a way that makes sense so we're not, you know, again, the things that are going to be, you know, working in Omaha may not be needed in McCook, right? So why should we make the folks in McCook do the same things that people in Omaha when, again, it doesn't really matter, doesn't do anything for them, doesn't limit the virus because they don't have the virus there, and it just causes inconvenience that then they may get tired and not want to follow it when we didn't need them to follow it. So we're trying to really tailor this to regions of the state and give local public health officials the flexibility to do what they, need, they feel like they need to do to be able to, you know, again, address the, the, the spread of the virus. I want to ask a, a, a question that's come in. A number of questions have come in, including from Lisa and Utan, about club teams pressuring players and athletes to practice. And obviously, high school sports has been a big part of what we've seen uh, hit hard this spring. So what's your advice there? Yeah, in fact, I've started to hear that and started to have questions about club sports and even folks saying, well, good, once schools are shut down, we can use for club sports. I'm going to be strongly recommending that not happen across the state. Actually, if you think of our first case, it happened at a, 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 certainly a Special Olympics event, but a sporting event in Fremont. There were many club sports activities going on at, at that time. It makes it actually very difficult on public health to be able to track down the source of this case. We're really still in a containment strategy in Nebraska, and I think it's a remarkable thing that we still are and able to try to contain that. But if you start gathering groups uh, of students or of people generally together, it's gonna get harder to contain that. And so that's the reason that I, I will be strongly recommending that they do not go ahead and proceed with those and, and wait, for, wait for this to play Play out. We can see where the next month goes versus uh, being in a position that we actually start letting things happen that would potentially provide more, more spread of this virus. I want to give Dr. Bloomstead and, and Pat Lopez, the Lancaster County Public Health Director, credit for almost setting the bar as far as sporting events go. I think it was the week of the Nebraska High School State Boys Basketball Tournament that they decided to limit it to immediate family members. And right after that was done, everybody followed suit. <laughs> so they really set, set the bar there as far as the athletic events go. Governor, I want to ask you another topic that we're getting a lot of questions on, including one from Ivy and Carney, has to do with Medicaid expansion. And some people feel like if that uh, would be in place right now in Nebraska, it would be easier for those lower income people to get the, get the treatment if, they, if they're going to need it. How would you respond to that? Well, first of all, everybody is going to get tested and get the treatment they need in Nebraska regardless. So that's really not going to be an issue. The thing about Medicaid expansion right now is we've already applied to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and we've you know, put in our waiver request. So we would have to go back, if we wanted to change course right now, we'd have to go back and ask for them to do something different. Um, it's, it's a months long process to get that. So for example, when we were talking about this with, uh, when we first applied back in December, they were setting the expectation we'd get our approval in April. And we've been building our systems based upon their approval. And we're in testing with those software systems right now. 
So if we were to change that right now, we'd have to rewrite all our systems that we've been working on now for over a year, uh, start from scratch to build new systems, and that would certainly push out our ability to roll out Medicaid expansion past our date of August 1st when we're going to start taking applications and October 1st when we're going to start offering coverage. That would push that back to the end of the year, if not into next year. So it, it will actually, if we try to change right now, it's not going to do us any good with regard to that. And frankly, it's not, you know, again, if you look at this stimulus package that is in front of the Congress right now and what that's going to do for folks and the other things they've already done with regard to making sure that, you know, Medicaid people aren't going to have co-pays and they're going to get coverage and all that sort of thing. Anybody who wants to be able to, who's going to need that coverage, who's going to need that test is going to be able to get it. Last question, Governor, as we're running out of time, so 30 seconds or so. Again, I asked you at the, at the top of the show, where are we headed in the next few weeks? Are you optimistic that we're going to get on the other side of this? Well, absolutely. At some point, we're going to get on the other side of this. <laughs> we're going to get through this. You know, back in 1918, a century ago, we came through the pandemic then and became the greatest nation in the world. I have no doubt we will come through this pandemic and be the greatest nation in the world. It's going to take time. And, we're, and that's the whole point. If we slow down the spread of the virus, that means it also draws it out longer but that will make sure that we preserve those hospital resources for the people who are most vulnerable. And that's our strategy, to make sure we can take care of those people who will need that hospital care because of this virus. You still think we're going to be having these conversations in July and August? Well, actually, I expect that, and again, you know, who knows what's going to happen, but I expect that as we implement these measures, we'll be able to start loosening them up as we get into that kind of time frame. Again, as we have better testing and better, better data, we'll know more about when we can actually do that. All right. Thank you very much. That is all the time we have tonight. Thanks uh, especially to Governor Pete Ricketts, also to Dr. Gary Antone and to Matt Bloomstead, the Commissioner of Education, all joining us and as well to the NET crew working behind the scenes to bring this program to you. Governor Ricketts is updating the public on the state's coronavirus response each weekday at 2 p.m. Central. You can watch those news conferences live online at netnebraska.org. You can also listen to those updates live on NET Radio. The NET News team will continue to answer your questions about COVID-19. Find all of our coverage online at netnebraska.org slash coronavirus. Next week on Speaking of Nebraska, we'll have more on the coronavirus pandemic. Until then, I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Thanks for watching.